Welcome to the Teach Joyfully podcast, where we talk about all things elementary teaching with some mom stuff thrown in. I'm Lisa Burns, a teacher success coach, veteran elementary teacher, and mom of five. I'll be your host. Thanks for joining me. Today, we're talking about 11 ways that you can connect, build relationships, and engage your students online. They're simple, simple ways that you can do this, and I'm There are tons of them. Today, I have 11 of them for you. Number one, do a survey. I know that seems obvious, but doing a survey and figuring out what matters most to kids, what matters most to your students, really can help set you up for success to connect with them right off the bat. So if you can get them to do a survey or have their parents help them fill it out and have that before you start live online lessons, boy, will that make a huge difference. If you've already started teaching and you don't have time, you didn't have time to do that before, that's okay. It's never too late. You can still do that and get a little more information. Number two, smile. Smile, smile, smile all the time. Place that smile on your face and smile as big as you can for the entire day. I know your cheeks will hurt. Trust me, I know, because I do this. I do this when I'm recording. I do this when I'm live online. I just do it all the time. I have trained myself to do this. You put a smile in your voice and a smile on your face. It makes a huge difference. And students are more likely to look at you and listen to you and hear that smile, which means they feel welcomed and they feel like they're of value and worthwhile because you've got a smile in your face and on your and in your voice. Number three, use your body language. This one, I can't stress this enough. It's so easy when we're online to just be staring at a screen and forget that our body language still matters. I'm reminded of um, a time in college when I had a friend who was deaf and we would go out to dinner and hang out. And one of the things that he finally told me was, you're not using your voice when you talk to me in sign language. I wasn't actually using my voice and speaking out loud because he couldn't hear me. So I didn't actually think I needed to do that. But what was happening was my facial expressions and my body language were very blank then. And he uses that to read context. And that was a huge mistake. And that's the same thing with your body language when you're online and on camera. If you're not using your body language and almost exaggerating your body language, your students can't get a read on what you really mean. There's a lot of things that we gather from body language that helps support what we're actually hearing. So we use our eyes to interpret just as much as we use our ears. So use your body language and exaggerate. The more you exaggerate, the more fun it is too. So use your body language and use as much hand motions and um, other information as you can to give students information about what it is you're doing. So you're almost like you're acting on stage. Number four, and number four goes right along with this and that is your intonation. The way you say things is just as important as what you're saying. That's true in live in the classroom in person, but it's also true when you're online. And just like your body language, this needs to be sometimes almost a little bit exaggerated because it loses something in translation when you coming through a microphone and a screen. And so anything you can do to give your students more information about what it is that you're meaning or what it is you're asking of them is incredibly helpful. Number five, this is something that most teachers already do in the classroom and many teachers are already doing online as well. And that's having special days. Things like, um, we're learning in our personal tent forts today or crazy hair day or spirit days. All of those things are fun and exciting and they help bond you together as a class because you had fun together, you did something silly, but you made learning fun for just one day. Don't have to do this every day. You can do it once a week, once a month, once every two weeks. 
You'll have to read your class and decide how much they can handle and still be learning. It's worth doing. These are important pieces to the school day and the school year. So number six is something that can easily be subtracted out of the equation because we're online. Sometimes teachers will forget to do this, but I think it's still a really important piece. Having a class meeting is an important place for you to bond, to get a read on your students, to really talk about things, to set up your school day. All of those things are really important. It's a place for you to remind students of things, but it's also a place for students to have a second to chat, to talk to each other, to get to know each other, and to bond. And I think that this is something that's easy to subtract out of the equation because we're so focused on just content and on students learning and even just showing up. But if we can provide a reason to show up, a reason to connect, it really does help students want to come more often as well. So this is an important piece. Don't take that one out. Number seven is obvious. Brain breaks. Lots of brain breaks, especially if you're online a good portion of the school day with your students, which unfortunately is happening. If that's the case, you can't necessarily control that. It's just something that's being required of you and of your students. So deal with it. Give your students lots of brain breaks and make them super fun. Do dance parties, go noodle, whatever it is that your students love, feed into that and do it. You can play games, anything that you can think of that will help engage them, get them moving, have fun. And this is a time when I do brain breaks in the physical classroom. I also like to incorporate this in the virtual classroom. And that is to make sure as our brain breaks that we're doing some time to do some crossovers and things like that because they're so good for the brain. So anything you can do to help the brain wake up and keep moving is incredibly helpful because staring at a screen produces a locked stare and it tends to put our brains a little bit to sleep over time. So wake those brains up, get kids moving, and then you can start again. Number eight might seem like it's a little bit off because you're busy being online. However, I think that snail mail is one of the most exciting things to students, to all kids actually. I know my own kids when they were little, couldn't wait to get letters from grandma. And grandma's always wrote back in our family. So that was such an exciting thing. My kids knew if they wrote a letter to grandma, for sure they were going to be getting mail. If you can send a postcard to your students a couple of times during this school year, they will be so thrilled. You can tell them it's coming or just surprise them, but they will love it and they will cherish that. Whenever my own kids have gotten postcards from teachers before school starts or right after school starts, oh my goodness, they saved those. They treasured them. They were really important for these kids to feel like, my kids to feel like they were connected to their teacher and their teacher cared about them. So don't forget to do a postcard on occasion. Now this one might seem a little bit awkward, but I really think it's an important and valuable way to work, especially if you're online a good portion of the day. As an entrepreneur, I do co-working sessions with some of my entrepreneur friends. So once or twice a month, we get together literally online, talk about what our goals are for a few minutes, and then we actually just start working. And everyone's working, we mute our microphones, and we all just get busy working. I know it sounds a little weird and it sounds awkward, but it really is a great way to work. We turn our microphones off, everyone gets busy and does their own thing. If we have a question, need to bounce an idea off someone or have a question, we just pop in and ask. This is also outstanding for team planning as you and your team are planning lessons for each month. You can work together without having to have your microphones on and then pop in when you have questions or you wanna bounce ideas off of each other. It's very effective, it's very efficient, and It feels like you're getting something done without having to sit there by yourself. It really is an awesome way to work. Now, this can work in your classroom. It can work for your students. Do an online silent reading time together. Sit down and read together for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Do it a couple of times a week. You can do it every day if you feel like you have the time and energy, whatever it is that works for you, but certainly try it at least once a week 
it has great potential for you and for your students because once you're done with your reading time, you can open up the microphones and have a discussion about what kinds of things everyone is reading. You can have an opportunity to do book endorsements or commercials or um, any of those or anything like that to try and help other kids find books that they love to read. It's a great time to also model silent reading when you're reading along with your students. So adults read, kids read, everyone can read at the same time. I think it's fun. It's a great way to kind of connect and talk about books and encourage reading as fun. On to number 10. So number 10 is having a Friday fun time. And it doesn't have to be on Friday, but having a time where maybe you meet for half an hour or an hour and you play games or do something fun together, or maybe it's a time to just talk and share. Students need the opportunity when they're at home online to connect. This is an essential piece for their emotional and mental well-being, but it's also a necessary piece in order for them to feel like a class. And this is an opportunity to do that. If you can't do it every week, do it once a month or twice a month, whatever it is that works for you. But I do feel like these times to just connect and do something fun together are essential. And last but not least, number 11. Number 11 is all about your lessons. Make your lessons as interactive as possible. I know this seems obvious, but it's not actually as obvious as you would think. It takes a lot of trial and error, And it takes a lot of time to figure out what works for you, what works for your students. But here's a few suggestions. One of the things I like to do is use Pear Deck. Pear Deck is an add-on that you can use with Microsoft PowerPoint or with Google Slides. And you can add it in and create interactive slides so students can actually each have the opportunity to drag and drop, fill in the blank, draw a picture, all kinds of responses. Anything you can do to provide students with an opportunity to respond is outstanding. Now, if you don't want to do something that's tech related, it is so easy for you to have students respond when they're live online with you without ever using any additional technology. They can each have individual whiteboards. They can have a sheet of paper on a clipboard or just a sheet of paper. It's easy. All you have to do is tell them what it is that you want them to be responding with as you're going through the day. So here's an example. If I'm doing a phonics lesson and I'm teaching, say I'm teaching a short O sound, I might say, okay, we're gonna go from, we're gonna have a couple of words and I want you to change them out. People, students would have a piece of paper with a pencil and eraser. They might have a piece of paper in a sheet protector with a marker and an eraser, or they might have a whiteboard, an individual whiteboard with, um, with a marker and eraser as well. Any of those things will work. So imagine I'm doing the short O sound and we're working on CVC words. So I might say the word hot. Students can write the word hot and lift it up and show me um, through their camera. So once they've done that, I'll say, okay, we're gonna go from hot to hop. And they can change out the T, erase, do a P, or they can write the new word underneath. And you can continue on from there. They can show you up in their camera every single time so you can see their answers and you can continue to move on. That way you get a quick read on where students are at, just like you would if you were in the classroom. I would use individual whiteboards for this in the classroom, but online, this method works fabulously. It's an easy way for everyone to respond and an easy way for you to check up on everyone as well. There's lots of other ways that students can respond. Be creative. You can have them each create signs from one to 10 and give you a score, or you can have them create a sign yes, and on the back it can say no. You can have them create all kinds of things that they can hold up and respond for whatever that day's response is. If you wanna create something silly or funny each day so that you know what students are saying, you can do that. You can have a lot of fun with this. In addition, I always like props. So making things interactive can include using props. So if you're talking about wild animals and you happen to have some stuffed animals in your home, you can use those as props. Your students can use props as well. If you tell them in advance what it is that you want them to help provide, and not everyone will have it, but that's okay. It can be a lot of fun. And your props can even just include a study buddy, someone to sit with them as they're working through their class with you. That can be encouraging and motivating in and of itself. Give them a chance during your morning meeting to share who's studying with them that day and go from there. 
I think it could be a lot of fun. It's another way to engage students and keep everybody motivated and learning. And that's my list. I hope you found something in here that's helpful that will help you connect with your students, create community, and have a great year. I'd love to hear the ways that you're connecting with your students and creating that sense of community and relationship in your classroom. Jump on into the Teach Joyfully podcast community on Facebook and let me know. So that's it, my teacher friends. We are out of time and I'm out of breath. Thanks so much for joining me today. If you liked today's episode, I'd love it if you'd go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and leave a review. And while you're there, hit the subscribe button so you'll never miss an episode. Also, you can continue the conversation online with me in my Facebook group, the Teach Joyfully podcast community, where elementary teachers can connect, get help, and encouragement for all kinds of parenting and education topics. You can find the show notes on my website at www.hopeineducation.com forward slash podcast. And remember, a happy teacher is a good teacher. So until next time, teach joyfully and take care of you.